you very much. Hi, everybody. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about Naxi, which is a web application for all for Nginx. So first, a few words about me. So I've been doing penetration testing since 2003, uh, and I started to get a strong interest into defensive security since uh, only a few years back, uh, simply because it felt uh, boring with time to always break uh, through the same doors. And the other reason is that uh, my company started doing hosting and we're facing uh, strong issues because we are doing hosting but for third parties so we do not have any grip on the, on the developers. So uh, even if I assume it's common knowledge, uh, most people here are quite aware of the issues. The thing is that uh, web applications, there's always a lot of customization so it's a lot harder to uh, have standard responses to uh, any security issues. Especially here, so we are doing hosting, so we do not have any grip on the developers and the quality of the code, and most of them are uh, like uh, e-commerce websites, so with a lot of uh, customization and very specific things. So it's just like you are a mechanic guy and you are uh, asked to handle only uh, tuned um, tuning cars uh, with a lot of uh, fancy options, but not always uh, very safe ideas. So uh, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to have web application for all because we can address the issue uh, at the very beginning, which is uh, either by educating the developers or make them fix uh, their own issues. However, here we are really talking about handling third parties problem. Like, okay, they have uh, issues, they get on, on a frequent basis, and that's say, I hand it over to you and then I don't want to hear about it anymore and you need to uh, solve it for them. Uh, so the fallback was web application for all. When I started the project in uh, 2011, um, it was not in the state it is right now. So because, for example, mod security was not yet ported to Nginx, uh, there's no real solution for Nginx. Uh, plus, I'm not a really strong believer in the big signatures uh, approach when it comes to web application security. Because, for example, when you see uh, talks like the one given by um, people from Portugal yesterday, you can see that uh, browsers have um, behaviors that can change and they will not stick to uh, the RFC, so it will become more and more difficult to uh, have with a single regular expression detect a cross-site scripting or an SQL injection, especially with very versatile language uh, such as JavaScript and the evolutions that are breeding by uh, HTML5. And so, C4 is the open source web application fault, so mostly uh, mod security. And when it comes to uh, proprietary web application for walls, uh, first of all, uh, our first result was the quality is very uneven. And it's not because it has a higher price tag that the quality is better. And it's very hard to get uh, feedback or integration. Plus, uh, the cost uh, might be uh, very difficult to handle, especially for a small company because we are not a very big company, so uh, we have uh, limited financial possibilities, but still a few thousand websites to handle. Uh, so that's why we started to uh, develop uh, Naxi. So Naxi, the idea is that instead of relying on very complex signatures like a big regular expression aiming to detect uh, most of the cross scripting or SQL injection, it will uh, rather focus on detecting the very small parts. Like it will uh, focus on simple quotes, double quotes, equals. Actually, most of the characters that we can uh, see in use very frequently in attacks. And whenever these tokens are detected, they will lead to a score increase that will uh, itself lead to an action. So it allows us to have a very small um, set of rules, of uh, basic rules that are uh, shipped in the default configuration, and it will still be able to uh, detect most of the attacks. And it's especially resilient against very obfuscated attacks. Like, for example, if you look at the challenge that were organized uh, back a few years uh, from by mod security in order to find bypasses in the SQL injection detection or cross scripting, most of the time you will end up with very complex uh, actually payloads that will aim at uh, either using browser specificities in order to have invalid HTML but that is still interpreted by the browser or very obfuscated patterns. And in the case of Naxi, as it will focus on these uh, small characters, it will lead to a very strong uh, score increase. Uh, the fact to have a, such a simple approach uh, has the advantage to have a very 
uh, quite small actually code base because it's uh, less than uh, 4,000 lines of C code. And it comes along with uh, tools in Python that are used mostly for uh, reporting and whitelist generation. And since uh, now uh, only a few months, we already also integrated libinjection. So I don't know if you know libinjection. It's uh, developed uh, by a company it's called uh, Plan 9, I think. And it's a uh, realize on tokenization in order to detect at least SQL injection and now as well uh, cross-seed scripting. The approach of the tokenization is a bit like a more evolved approach that what Naxi attempts to do by spotting the characters that are used in common attacks. So, uh, as Naxi doesn't rely on complex signatures, the downside will be that you need to focus a lot more on to learning because you can have very easily false positives. For example, as soon as you will have uh, fields that are very open for the user to interact with, if it's uh, even common text, it can lead to some false positive if they need to use simple quotes or double quotes. So, uh, there is the global workflow is that, so Nax is a model for Nginx, it will produce logs. Uh, these logs can then be transformed and injected into an Elasticsearch database. So, Elasticsearch database uh, for us has two advantages. First one is that um, in terms of visualization, because as, I, as I'm very, very bad at HTML and things like this, we tried in the past to have our own console, but it was a, quite a failure. So actually using, for example, uh, soft such as Kibana, you can uh, produce awesome dashboards with uh, absolute zero knowledge, as long as your data is formatted in a correct way. So the logs are injected uh, into Elasticsearch, first for visualization, and then there's a tool called uh, NX API or NX tool uh, that has two goals. First, it will allow you to uh, generate the whitelist because when you will put your site in production at the beginning, as Naxi is very dumb and doesn't rely on complex signatures, for example, even in the cookies, it might trigger a lot of false positive if you use Google Analytics because, uh, oh, there's a lot of weird characters, so it will uh, raise you alerts. And then this tool, uh, relying on the data that is into the Elasticsearch will generate whitelist for you that you can later set up in production. And so you run into a cycle like this and as soon as you see that the exceptions that are reported by the web application for all are not false positives, it means that the learning is over. So this is for the global workflow. So in this approach, uh, the main weakness is the need for learning because it's uh, very prone to false positive. And if you're on uh, applications that evolve in a very fast way, I mean, uh, strong evolution, not just adding a few pages, but changing the way the user can interact with the application, uh, then it requires some coordination uh, because else when there's a new uh, version that is deployed, you might break things. And if you are not in learning, you might block legitimate users. And it has no intelligence, which means it's unsuitable for some specific case. Because, for example, a few months ago, there was a vulnerability on an e-commerce solution called Ibris, which has a great idea to send data legitimately in base uh, 64, like for pass to images. Naxi has no intelligence. He has a very limited decoding abilities. So in some specific case like this, it's a corner case for him. It's very difficult to manage. Uh, on the other hand, it has a very good resilience against unknown and unobfuscated attacks. Since the project started, we never had to modify the core rule set uh, because of a new exploit or of a new vulnerability that appeared. Uh, the simple approach has this advantage. And it has a very good performances. Uh, I will talk a bit about this later, but it has a very, very low memory footprint uh, as well as uh, CPU usage. And it was one of the challenges we had since the beginning in the conception. Plus, as long as the um, application didn't evolve, you never have to uh, update rule sets or update new signatures because it has no signatures. So once it's set up, you can let it run for years and years without having to touch it, as long as you didn't change uh, radically the uh, application. And uh, the learning process is now very strongly, you are strongly assisted in the process because at the beginning it was something extremely troublesome and now it's getting better and better. So in terms of what it's able to pass, it is able to pass uh, most, I mean, classical things, uh, JSON and various kind of, uh, of posts, which are form URL encoded and uh, multi-part and form data. 
So this is what uh, the various piece of uh, NAXI configuration looks like. So the first one, for example, it's a detection rule. So it will be every time composed of a, a string or a regular expression, which is what you are in you want to match into the HTTP traffic and what is called the match zone, which is where do you want to match poten potentially, sorry, um, this, uh, this pattern. Uh, then you have score, which means that if the pattern is detected in one of the zones, then the score will increase, for example, here, uh, SQL by 4 or XSS by 8 plus an ID that is using for whitelists. So regarding what we call Magion, it's simply a way to uh, cut the HTTP request into various parts, which are the URL, uh, the arguments that are given in get uh, after the end of the URL, the HTTP headers, uh, the body, or file extensions in the case of uh, file uploads. Then you have the check rules. That means that once the request is processed, uh, the request will reach a specific score, and then you will say if uh, the request will reach or get higher than an uh, SQL score of 8, then you can decide to either log the request, block it, or drop it. Uh, the difference between a block and drop is that uh, as there is an important learning process, while, while you are in learning, you still want to be able to drop some specific malevolent request. So that's why drop is for, but I will come back on, on this later. And then finally, you have the whitelist that are generated by the tools. Like for example, uh, here we are saying that we want to uh, allow a specific pattern to be present in the uh, HTTP headers named cookie, but only for the, the URI uh, slash X. So uh, the learning process is the uh, most uh, troublesome part of not having complex signatures. So it's relying on the logs that are inserted into uh, Elasticsearch, and then there's a tool that helps the user to create a whitelist. So there's several approaches. A uh, lot of uh, applications are quite standardized. For example, if you take uh, common frameworks or uh, solutions, so you can create templates. For example, there are some people in the community that will maintain uh, whitelist templates for Naxi, for WordPress or Drupal, so that people don't have to do learning on their own and they can use it the uh, ones that are produced by the community. However, as soon as you get into custom applications, you need to create your own one. And then, we can do it simply based on the statistics. It means that, for example, if 80% uh, of my users are all triggering the same event in the same page, it probably means that it's a false positive, and then I want to whitelist it. And this is what the tool is here for, is spotting the very common patterns, and then say, okay, this is a false positive, we want to whitelist it, and it will generate the whitelist for the user with giving him some uh, indications on why the tool thinks it's a false positive. And then once you generated your whitelist, you can then tag the events into the database to say, okay, all these events were false positive, we tag them. So you get an increased visibility on the current learning state of your web application firewall. So Naxi relies on two main modes, which are the learning phase, which is at the very beginning, and the blocking phase. So during the learning phase, all the HTTP requests are analyzed, but nothing is blocked. Uh, Naxi will simply log everything it sees and every anomaly it sees for further analysis. And once you are satisfied with your learning, Naxi can be set to blocking mode, where every request that uh, match an ID that was not predicted or allowed will get blocked. However, there's a tweak because when we are doing learning, especially if you, have, uh, you are doing learning on websites that are directly exposed to inter on the internet uh, with uh, no trusted traffic source, then you still want to be able to protect your site uh, from attacks during this learning phase. And especially if you have, uh, for example, a site with very, very low traffic, you might get more noise from boats and people attempting to break in than from legitimate users. It might be true for people like, that have like small personal websites. So uh, when you are in learning, in learning mode, you can still drop some specific requests, relying on some third-party tools, for example, uh, libinjection or some blacklists uh, that are produced by uh, another company. But I will uh, speak about this uh, a bit later. So uh, for the, the learning mode, 
when it comes to market, market applications, uh, so for example, WordPress, or actually most of the uh, framework or the common framework, you can see pattern on the way, for example, the forms will work. Because the main, the hardest path with learning, for example, is when you have websites with very strong user interaction, like for example, forums or contact, uh, contact forms and so on. However, they all behave more or less in the same way. So you can predict uh, what are the, the ideas are going to match. For example, when you are using WordPress, a lot of the uh, form fields will, will uh, use brackets within the variable names, which is something for Next it's not, it's abnormal, so it wants to block it. However, you can create templates that will predict this and ease the process of learning. And when it comes to uh, homemade application, you have several options. So either you rely on statistics, but it's only viable if you have uh, traffic that, I, uh, that is high enough so that the noise provoked by uh, boats or automated exploit items are low enough so that they won't pollute the learning process. And for the last case, you can always uh, rely on trusted traffic sources. For example, if you have the chance to be able to do the learning during uh, QA or staging phases where you know that most of your traffic can be trusted. And so even when it comes to uh, non non-market applications, uh, the learning tool with, will uh, rely on what is called templates. It's uh, as a learning tool, his sole job is to query Elasticsearch and asking globally for what is the most common exception that was triggered by the most users, because this is probably a false positive, so it's simply uh, Elasticsearch queries. And the templates are Elasticsearch queries that are optimized because we know it's things that will happen often. For example, Google Analytics in the cookies, it will always behave in the same way. So you can have uh, predefined templates that if you use to use Google Analytics, they will match immediately and suggest you the right whitelist. So, uh, for example, this is a, an example of a template and whitelist. So, at the bottom, you can see, for example, this is a template for uh, Magento, which is an e-commerce solution. So, uh, simply here, we want to uh, allow uh, open and closing brackets in the variable names for a specific forms, because all the Magento uh, instance will have the same behavior. So, you can predict this and directly have the right whitelist. And on the top here, it's a, a, a different approach. It's, it will attempt to detect whether or not a Magento is present because it says, if a Magento is present, then we will very probably see uh, opening and closing brackets in variable names in post on this specific page. And as soon as uh, some part of the templates match, you know that it's a Magento application, and then you can apply the rest of the template because you know all the Magento will have this and this and, and this specific behavior that you can predict and earn a lot of time uh, for learning. For us, this is especially useful because uh, we have uh, several thousand websites, but we do not uh, have grip with uh, developers or things like this. So we get new sites, and the idea is to detect as fast as possible whether it's a standard application, if it's something that is completely homegrown, or if it's a mix of several applications, like, for example, e-commerce website with a WordPress and some custom parts. So the idea is to be able to reduce the, the learning process. So here an example of how the, um, the learning tools behave. So, uh, so far it's a simple uh, Python tool in command line. So it will query directly the Elasticsearch database. Like here, for example, I'm querying the database for a specific website that is currently in learning. So first of all, it will tell me the whitelisting ratio that has already been done. Means that amongst all the events here, like uh, 85,000 um, events, only 70% only of them have been tagged as whitelisted and uh, as false positive. And then it will as well tell you the top you arise on which you will see the most frequent exception happens. So you can, in this way, you can progress into learning. First, you will try to do the learning on the parts uh, that will trigger the most false positive. Because, for example, if you take a, a brand new site with no specific rule set, at the beginning, even the cookies will match, will trigger false positive. So, which means every user on every page in every request will generate an event. And as soon as you did, for example, learning for the cookies the exception rate will uh, drastically drop. And you can apply the same thing on the URIs. Because here, for example, probably it's the reason it's matching so much here, it's 
uh, because it's a formula uh, form where people can update their profile, so input a lot of uh, uncommon things, especially if they can update their password, which will trigger false positives because they will see uncommon characters in the, in the password. So it will do this first level of reporting to uh, help the user perform his whitelist. And then there's the headers, because the zones, so either the headers or the URIs or uh, the body, in which the most exception were seen. So here, for example, we can see that it's still a very fresh sheet because a lot of uh, events still happen in the headers, spe specifically in the cookie, which means that nothing has been done. And for example, here, as soon if we uh, solve the, the main form and the headers uh, in terms of learning, the application, uh, the exception rate will drop so drastically, maybe then uh, only a, a few more days of learning and the application will be ready to go into blocking mode. So, first it helps you to know in which direction you need to work for generating whitelist and then it will actually help you to generate whitelist. Like for example, we are still on the same example with uh, open and closing brackets in the names of the variables. Here it will say it thinks that it is a, indeed a false positive. Why? Because uh, there's 345 different unique peers that trigger the same exception and which represent 70% of all the users. So if nearly 20% and several hundred of users are all triggering the same events, you can be pretty sure it's a false positive or you're under quite a consistent attack. And then as well, it will uh, provide you some extra information, like for example, a sample of contents that trigger the event. So the idea is that Nexi, when it's in learning mode, allows you to log uh, as well the content of the variable that triggers. So it allows you to then process it with third party tools, uh, either lib injection or the web application firewall to decrease the false positive rate. Like you get a lot of events and then you will use another firewall as well or, or third party tools to detect whether it's spam or it's legitimate content and then you can reduce the volume and exception and do the learning only on the uh, refined data set. And so the idea is here, um, so NX uh, tool comes with a lot of uh, uh, templates and generic templates. So you can either say, okay, I know it's a Magento, so please generate me only the whitelist for Magento. Or here I'm like using the full auto mode, which will attend all of the templates and all of the possible whitelists and only provide you the ones that uh, match it. Um, high enough volume of traffic to be considered as legitimate. And internally, in order to do so, it uh, relies on scoring system. Say like, for example, if less than 10% of my legitimate user triggered an exception, that I'm less inclined to consider as a false positive because 10% is not much. But on the other hand, if more than 20% of the people uh, will generate this event, then it's probably a false positive. So. This is how it works and trying to help the user with uh, uh, rating systems. So this is typically uh, an, an example of an event that is put by Nexi into Elasticsearch. So we have in which uh, zone uh, did the exception happen? The peer IP of the people emitting the request uh, that contained some unusual content. The fact that it was already uh, or not tagged as a whitelist, as a URI on which uh, the event happens. And then the comments. Comments will be used either to say at uh, when the event was imported into the database, so we can have uh, time tracking, or when was it uh, whitelisted, so we can know, okay, at uh, yesterday at 6 p.m. we decided to whitelist all this, so now it shouldn't be an issue anymore. Then it will provide as well the server, which is a full FQDN of the uh, server and the content. If enabled, it will uh, provide you a sample of the data that actually trigger. Like for example, you have a rule that will uh, match on open closing brackets. It will say, I match it on open closing brackets and here's an example of a user that actually triggers in content and you, it will put the content directly into Elasticsearch so the human when doing the whitelist process can review things and see, okay, it looks legitimate or it doesn't look legitimate. And here's uh, the variable name. As well, it will uh, include the uh, coordinates and the originating country because uh, so are, I'm working in a French company and a lot of our customers are very French-centric people. So when we are doing learning, we can ask the learning tool to uh, consider with a higher priority events that are coming from French IPs. Because for example, when you have a, 
website infringes a uh, lot less chance that the event you will see coming from China or Russia are legitimate. So it will allow you to reduce a lot the scope, especially as there is a um, lot of, uh, you know, internet noise and uh, bots coming off and trying to scan things. So it will allow you to reduce this. Or for example, you can, uh, when you are doing your learning, you can specifically uh, exclude some countries. And as well, it's a uh, cool for having awesome dashboards with the little maps and tup, 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 the little dots, but it's mostly for, you know, management because they like this kind of things. And uh, so the dates at which the event happen and the idea of the event. The idea is that, for example, a user that is sending a, re a request with a lot of, uh, for example, if we take a real uh, XSS uh, cross site scripting sample that is sent, actually it will match multiple rules like opening brackets, uh, the codes, simple codes, double codes, uh, dash, etc. So it means that for Naxi, one request will generate maybe 10 or 20 events if, has, if it has a lot of weird characters. And these events are uh, treated individu individually, which means like on the dashboard, Two mal uh, if there's one false positive, usually there's only like, for example, one or two characters that will match, but a real payload will uh, generate 10 matches. So it will uh, represent a higher volume of data, which is uh, useful when you are doing a visualization of data because you can see users that will trigger uh, very, uh, uh, how to explain? that will trigger a lot of different events within one request. You can be pretty sure it's not a legitimate request, but indeed an attack. Or else the guy has a very weird name with a lot of codes and brackets in his name, but it's not going to happen much. And so this is an uh, example of a Kibana dashboard. So this one is a simple one. However, oh, so I'm, I'm not sure you can see with uh, the colors. So you have like uh, uh, graphs of uh, all the websites and the level of events. And for example, uh, even if you are only using learning mode, because uh, we know some people in the community, they don't want to uh, do the learning process because they think it's too troublesome, or they do have uh, applications that are moving too fast. But only in terms of visualization of level of attacks, it can be extremely useful because if there's someone scanning or attempting an attack on your website, you will clearly see a huge raise. And here, for example, we have, as you can see, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 20 websites that are in the top 20. And so you can immediately see, okay, this website is being specifically targeted by a scan or something like that uh, right now. So it's quite useful for uh, the, the monitoring teams. So as well, uh, with uh, Kibana, you can put the little uh, world map if you want to, to show off to people, but it's not very uh, useful for real. But still an awesome feature. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, as you can see, learning can be uh, quite troublesome. Uh, however, Nginx being an awesome software, uh, you can do a lot of uh, cool tricks to make the process very simpler. A uh, lot of uh, the behavior of Naxi can be controlled uh, by variables that can be set within Nginx scripting. Like, for example, uh, we are setting up a new site that websites need to be in production. And we want, uh, we know the website has some vulnerability on, so on some specific page. You can say, okay, I'm going to enable Naxi just for this specific page, or I'm going to uh, turn on learning for everyone except this IP, or for everyone except people from this country. So you can, it's a kind of a Swiss knife. It means it has a very simple functionalities. However, you can easily interact with it uh, using Nginx scripting. Uh, plus, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with Nginx, but Nginx works uh, with a principle of location, which point to different parts of a website. And for example, one thing, one thing you don't want to do is to try to do learning on a, a back office of a very complex CMS, because people will tap HTML and so on in the back end, and it will soon become a nightmare for you. So you can definitely exclude this kind of parts of the web application for all very simply. So here, for example, I'm saying people coming from a very specific uh, address, I will disable learning and I will turn on the lib injection engine. Uh, but as well, if, for example, if there's tomorrow a vulnerability that appears on a, a WordPress or a SQL injection on a specific WordPress plugin, you can say for this specific URL or this URL matching this regular expression, I'm going to enable lib injection and I'm going to turn off learning. So it means that uh, every SQL attempt will be dropped but uh, only for this URL or this parameter, which is quite convenient when you need to uh, do some uh, quick and dirty patching or uh, react very quickly uh, facing vulnerabilities. 
So uh, using this kind of variable, so you can turn Laxi on off, turn learning on off. There's also something uh, quite useful, which is called post action. So it's specific to Nginx post action is a directive that says, once you finish processing the request, uh, please send the user to this specific location. And for example, in Laxi, we are using it uh, for when you are dropping someone, you decide that the request is illegal. Instead of just returning a specific error code, you can first give him an error code and then redirect him to another page where he asks to enter a CAPTCHA in order to validate eventual false positive. So which is something quite convenient, even if some uh, people might think it's uh, intrusive. If you are doing like internal learning, it's uh, extremely convenient. And you can uh, as well turn on and off uh, lib injection, uh, both for SQL or XSS. Uh, so, as I was saying, so there's uh, two external things. So, the original idea of Nexi, or actually my original idea, was uh, that signatures are bad and regular expressions are even worse. Uh, however, some people disagree with me, and especially people doing share hosting, uh, because we have the chance to have uh, only like uh, quite big customers, so we can spend some time working on each individual website. However, uh, for example, there's a German company called Mars System. Uh, which is doing a lot of mutual or shared hosting, and they are uh, keeping up doxy rules, which are simply a set of blacklists based on the emerging threat uh, system. So they are doing blacklists for Naxi generating blacklist rules, and it comes along with a cool client uh, that allows automatic update uh, with a dashboard. Sorry, with a dashboard because they can do HTML and uh, and things like this. So it's quite useful, even if you are doing a mutual hosting or anything to have this so just you can have a visualization and that it's uh, emerging threat it has a very very low false positive rates and he's very cautious about this so it's a uh, it's it comes handy and for example we use it during the learning phase in order to be able to uh, fend off the most obvious attacks and uh, as well lib injection is a good complement uh, to to Nexi. So, sorry, I just speak about this. So, uh, feedback from real life. Um, the approach is, uh, might, uh, might seem extremely trivial, however, it works quite well. Uh, we, uh, we challenge it uh, quite a lot, and especially it stays very simple to manage. So, you don't have to, you don't need a PhD in PCRE uh, to be able to maintain the whitelist or the rules, which is something convenient. And uh, it's uh, not hungry at all. It's, uh, very simple, it's very cheap in terms of resources, both uh, memory and CPU. However, some specific cases, as I speak earlier, like for example, legitimate content in base64 uh, is not something easy to handle because it does very limited decoding. For example, mod security is able to handle this kind of uh, case. Uh, Naxi for him, it's quite uh, complicated. You need to uh, predict the various uh, possible uh, encoded patterns in bus 64 to output several rules, so it's not optimized at all. So uh, a few uh, achievements. So it has been uh, used at least to protect one uh, very, very big website uh, that um, handled a few terabytes of uh, traffic uh, on um, during peak, uh, peak season. And for us, we use it on uh, more than two gigabytes incoming traffic as we are doing a lot of e-commerce uh, during sales. It's a very good example to see how well does it uh, scale uh, during student uh, traffic pike. And uh, it has been uh, uh, audited uh, quite a lot and challenged. So if anyone of you happen to either find cool things or want to uh, set up CTF and bug bounties, we're always open to uh, help with bug bounties on, on Naxi or provide some kind of support. So thank you for your attention and if you have uh, any questions. Oh, so actually, for example, for, ah, oh, sorry, uh, is it only checking for simple characters? Uh, no, not only, it's mostly checking for simple characters, uh, but as well, it might use some keywords, like, for example, for uh, SQL injection, but not for JavaScript at all. It has, like, no keywords for HTML or JavaScript because we think it's too versatile and can be mati manipulated too easily. However, it uses some keywords for SQL because if you want to uh, avoid using keywords and you will have to use 
weird characters in order to bypass uh, eventual regular expressions. You don't agree? <laughs> Mm -hmm. What, what the, more specifically, what are you thinking about? Yes. Yeah, actually, it's. Uh, I mean, uh, any any request that uh, will either uh, have uh, anomalies in terms of the uh, ways a request is construct, or any of the internal rules will match. But I'm not sure to. I don't know uh, specifically which case you are thinking about. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Y yes, it will. But uh, however, if um, I mean, I always always encourage people. We try to uh, set up a lot of changes with some bug bounties in order to uh, push people to find bypass. Because uh, I do think that uh, web application folds are not silver bullet at all. So I'm always encouraging people to try to find some some new stuff. So if you happen to have ideas, please don't hesitate to try or at least suggest the idea. Any more questions? Ah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's uh, on uh, GitHub. Oh, sorry, it was on the uh, first slide. I forgot to mention it. So it's open source. It's on uh, GitHub and it's uh, GPL. Um, here. You can fetch it on GitHub. Actually, it's uh, as well present in quite a number of uh, distribution. It was present in uh, uh, Debian until I think the next ones are dropping it. But it's uh, present in most uh, BSD package. You can fetch it directly from the official repositories. Yes? Um, maybe I didn't get it uh, quite well, but uh, it seemed like your whitelisting works uh, against the Elasticsearch logs. Mm -hmm. So I guess you don't log everything. Like there's a certain, like the data, like you, don't, you don't log all the packets. So how can you whitelist uh, uh, like a more complicated field? Well. Not like your eye or uh, any other cookie header. Oh, so uh, uh, actually, so it's in the. In uh, Elasticsearch, what we will log is that uh, so every kind of uh, violation, and we will put as well a sample of the data, but not the wall, uh, not the wall request inside. So the idea is for, um, for example, if a new parameter appears on a URI, for us it's not an issue, except if uh, this parameter is either constructed in a weird way or contains some uh, uncommon data, then it will be logged. So it doesn't log all the traffic, but only all the traffic that it. Uh, things that is uncommon or might be uh, an attack. All right, and I have a second question. Mm -hmm. um, what amount uh, does it really depend on the nginx, or if you have like different thoughts about other platforms? Uh, no, no other thoughts about uh, other platforms. Actually, the reason I developed uh, Nexus is because we are using nginx a lot, and I really like uh, nginx's uh, approach. So I'm not planning to port it on Apache or things like this. Yes? Oh. I would like to know how you are deploying the Nexus. Are you deploying it uh, compiling the source code together with Nginx like you do with other modules? Or are you, are you using Nginx with your modules like your reverse proxy? We are using Nginx with our module as reverse proxies. Okay, and what about the HTTPS? Uh, actually, for us, it's a reverse proxy that will offload the certificate so we can still. The certificate you have for the traffic. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, okay. it's both HTTP or HTTPS. Okay. And you, yes? Uh, you may have talked about it, but I want to get into a little bit. I have two questions. One is, um, APIs, like APIs, 
Uh, yes. Yes, yes, Jason, yes. Uh, no, uh, so the question was about uh, JSON and uh, WebSocket. So JSON, yes, because it's something we face. Uh, WebSocket, uh, not yet. We started to think about it, but uh, I think it will uh, require a more uh, evolved approach in order to uh, give consistent results. Any more questions? So thank you very much.